I am at Dr. Sukant Khurana's apartment in Lucknow. Here is someone who wears many hats, artist, scientist, entrepreneur and a few more. I think you all have the same question right now as in my head. Why art and science? It's not easy to get grips with the idea that the guy in front of you is a well-published logical scientist and a well-sold whimsical artist. Well, it's a tough question if I really try to answer it analytically, but uh, at the heart of it, ask yourself, isn't science, art and even spirituality and beginnings of religion trying to get to the same thing? So we're trying to answer the infinitesimally large universe around us, right? We bunch of naked apes who have no clue of the world around us and we're trying to make sense of it. We're trying to imagine where we came from, what is our purpose, what can we do to make it better. We are all trying to shape our dreams and at some level, science, art, philosophy and religion all serve the same purpose because they are all one continuum. And you are an entrepreneur too. It's like you walked into a college and opted for arts, science and commerce dreams. Well, uh, I dream 10,000 dreams every day. And if I tell you my list of dreams, you'll be really frustrated because time is limited, resources are limited and you can only give shape to few. I try to give shape to at least few of them in the limited time I have. Streams, degrees are just to get by in life because I rose from rags, somewhat middle class, not even entirely so. So I needed to rise up, I needed to get degrees to have a secure future. But beyond that, degrees have no meaning. I'm an autodidact in whatever subject I choose to study. And you're an activist who dropped a going concern in the US to come back in 2010. Well, I was an activist. I'm a data scientist activist sort of now. So I encountered hell when I came back to India. Before that also actually, I came back in 2010 first to take part in anti-corruption movement. I should have uh, made best use of a really wonderful PhD out of which three projects are still not published and basically I had a wonderful team of 70 undergraduates running a massive screen for me. I had wonderful biotechnology neuroscience efforts going on and I thought a bit arrogantly that I can change India. At that time there were more democratic forces trying to make our world more democratic. Uh, that was the Arab Spring. I thought of anti-corruption in India and trying to make India a better place. But that was not a whim. I was involved in trying to change India from 2003 when I went to US. But my efforts were very much, you can say, alien to India because I am a centrist. At best can be described as left or center, but really a centrist basically a pro-democrat, open society professing person and what has happened is I managed to piss off the far right because I was opposed to extremes of Hinduism as well as Islam in India, extremism from both ends and then I managed to piss off uh, the far left because I didn't conform to their ideology. So my logic has been to fight for democratic open society which provide a level playing field for people. It's not indoctrinated left, it's not indoctrinated right. It's about love with free societies, it's about love with western societies and maybe I was trying to bring in something which was foreign to India based on what I thought is the right way and whether I was right or wrong would never be known because I finally gave up. So in 2000 uh, from 2003, I was writing things, people on different religious extremes found me opposed to their views. They wrote articles against me and I was put in various lists. Then I managed to antagonize somebody of extreme relig religious left, I would say, fanatic left. And that guy or people from that end, like he 
had my account in 2013, then in 2014, 2014 had disastrous consequences. I had offers from New Jersey, from Kings, and various other places actually. I had offers from various places. Uh, but I thought, what the hell, maybe I was a bit overconfident, I came to India. Uh, coming to India, I faced hell in Bengal. It was good because I started different things, I found a lot of new plants, I found a lot of interesting things with drug discovery. It was great, but uh, people conspired against me non-stop. People worked against me, there were two attempts on my life. I was about to run back to USA and as people say home is where your heart is, US is home to people who have a mission, who have talent, who want to make it big. I was about to run away to US or Canada. But instead of running away, somebody suggested me a place in Lucknow and said, well, we know eventually you'll go back because that's where you really belong. But why not give your two or three years of your life to India and whatever interesting things you have discovered in drug discovery, whatever interesting things you made in artificial intelligence, give shape to them. So I decided to stay in India for that little bit. And here I am in Lucknow and giving shape to my dreams. Coming to your way of doing art, the technique you invented called creative destruction. Well, it's interesting you bring it up. Um, see, in society, if you need to put up fake smiles, every day's effort doesn't necessarily add up to the next day. So I paint one layer a day and then I leave it out for weathering. Sometimes I shoot it. Sometimes I attack it with knife, sometimes I attack it with fire. I destroy that layer pretty much. And then I paint it over. I repeat the cycle several times and that's creative destruction. Uh, you don't have that much of that in Lucknow because the stage of life I'm at, I'm actually at peace. Wherever things were not adding up, it belonged to that phase. So there were some pieces of art that belong to creative destruction. It was autobiographical. It's no longer true, so I'm not any longer making pieces which belong to creative destructions. They were made while I was in Austin, while I was in New York City, and while I was in Bengal. I'm quite happy in Lakhau, and I'm no longer making those pieces. And destructive creation. Why don't you think each work is a masterpiece? Instead, you paint it, wash it off, and then paint a new layer. I'm not sure if each work is a masterpiece, if anything is a masterpiece. Uh, beauty is in the of beholder, but the point is that when life starts to add up, not in an amazing manner, not an overnight success, but things start to gradually add up, how do you capture it? How do you capture it metaphorically? To me, each layer voting, each layer saying that I exist, each layer saying I live, I breathe, and I'm here to make my day count make sense. And the way I do it is I paint the layer, but I wash it, and then I paint another layer. And finally, the whole painting is a net sum of each day adding up instead of each day destroying it, each other. Let me demonstrate. So we are back in the studio now. Yeah, so as you saw, I paint it and then I wash it, I paint and then I wash the painting again, over and over again. This is in contrast to painting and then maybe shooting a gun at it, maybe then attacking it with a knife maybe then washing it or maybe letting it out in rain after it's dried. So I wash it when it's not entirely dried. So it washes away but it leaves the mark. That way each layer contributes something to the final mode, to the final say of the painting. So this painting gradually evolves. Now what you can say out of that is why is a painting having multiple layers and I don't get all of it? That's all right. I know all the layers, maybe even I don't know if I forget them. The painting has a history, it's complex, it's about the story, it is almost as living as a living entity, that's what I aspire to do. 
Now, if you can feel it, if you can live it, you can enjoy it, it's up to you. If you cannot, just appreciate it. It's aesthetics. Wonderful. Not all art makes a statement, but this rather strongly does. Mm. How much of your science is in your art? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, it fluctuates. Actually, at times, there is no rhyme and reason. It's simply emotion to what I'm painting. Sometimes I'm exploring systematically how line goes together with color, how it goes together with form. It's purely analytical at times, sometimes it's purely synthetic, sometimes it's purely emotional. So it's not about what is in there, it's about celebrating the feeling. It's not about whether it's science or not, but obviously being trained as a scientist, I cannot help but explore as a uh, explore an issue systematically. So when I ask the issue of creative destruction, I take it to its logical extreme. When I ask the issue of destructive creation, I take it to its logical extreme. Um, bit of an OCD, I can't help it. I keep doing it over and over again. But unfortunately, time is limited, so I can only do so many experiments. It's like an experiment in the lab. You just get to do experiment on your canvas instead of the lab. Coming back to destructive creation, you have done live shows, making performing art or fine art. Does having all those people watching you affect you, affect the way you think about your art? Mm, call it arrogant, I can block most people. So it really doesn't, as long as they are not getting in my personal space. Uh, I keep doing whatever I have to do. I have been very good in being anti-social, doing whatever I like. So it hasn't really affected. I've seen you doing some bizarre stuff, stamping on your work, placing the canvas on plants to get their impression. Why not a brush and a paint? Well, I use brush and paint at times. The point is, the whole universe is your canvas. And why do you want to restrict yourself to tools, uh, which are defined by, let's say, academic art world? That's how I approach my science also. Don't let others define your boundaries. Keep breaking the boundaries that you encounter. So I do use brush, but it's just one of the many tools. This is a mandatory question. Uh, what were the formative influences on your art? Did you train with someone, read books or visit galleries? Huh. I visited galleries, I read quite a bit, but I actually never trained with anyone. Maybe that has allowed me to experiment without really thinking that there are any boundaries. So. Uh, my parents were highly encouraging of me uh, ruining, let's say, a bedroom wall, making paintings, sketches there, and I've just continued on from then. And I realized that I can do art without being formally trained, but I cannot do science without being formally trained. So I opted for science. It could have very well been art if I could do science while being informally trained. So it was just almost a, you know, toss of a coin, roll of a dice for me. Both of them have been kind of equally the same. They've been a continued spectrum of creativity. You also happen to be an art buyer. So what do I need to do to sell you something? Well, I'm not much into craft. So for me, the basic distinction is if a piece of art can provoke, it is not different, it is not the same as traditional art, it's not repeating, it's not simply uh, repeating an aesthetic pattern, it's not repeating the same old beaten down philosophical question. For me, art is extension of science and philosophy, so it has to be able to provoke. It can also be an extension of politics, so it has to be something new, and as long as it's something new, something that I did not think of uh, that topic before, that is the kind of art that provokes me, whether it is a piece of time questioning the nature of natural time versus perceived time by Salvador Dali, or it could be a cow eating India by a local Indian artist, say Shikhan Sabdania. I'm interested in that. I'm interested in something that makes me think beyond I was thinking. So for me, the kick is give me something more than I thought of anyway. That's 
what is art for me. It's not necessarily aesthetics, it's not necessarily beauty. That's what I tend to buy. So everyone, that was a glimpse of Dr. Sukant Kurana for you.